Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Council's Foreign and Foreign Relations History Makers Series with Dr. Hans Blix. I'm Mitchell Wallerstein, the president of Baruch College, and I'm pleased to be presiding this evening. Uh, the History Maker Series focuses on the contributions <coughs> made by prominent individuals at a critical juncture in U.S. foreign policy or international relations. On behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations, I would like to thank Richard Plepler and HBO for their generous support uh, of this series. So um, I would like to first welcome our guest, Dr. Blix. Uh, we are privileged to have him here with us this evening. Uh, you all have received a copy of his bio, so I will not go into a lot of detail, uh, except to say that when the history of uh, uh, the international and regional affairs at the end of the 20th century is written, I believe Dr. Blix will be recognized as an important figure. Uh, he played a significant role, first as a Swedish diplomat, and then as uh, the foreign minister of Sweden, uh, and then, of course, as head of, the, of two multilateral organizations, the serving as director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, from 1981 to uh, 1997, and then coming back from retirement at the request of UN Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, to serve as executive chairman of uh, the first executive chairman, actually, of, of UNMOVE, the UN Monitoring, Verification, and Inspection Commission. So we will uh, engage in a, uh, in a conversation, and then uh, I will uh, open it to uh, questions from the, the members. Dr. Blix, you led the IAEA for 16 years through a tumultuous period from 1981 to 97, and you played a significant role, and the organization played a significant role in events uh, including the, uh, the aftermath of the Israeli bombing of the Osirak reactor in 1981 uh, and the uh, Chernobyl disaster in 1986. Uh, we'll get into the Iraqi and nuclear weapons program in a moment, but uh, these earlier events, of course, raised serious uh, debate uh, about uh, the circumstances under which uh, a, a state has the, uh, the, the ability to uh, move unilaterally, uh, to take military action uh, when they feel that there is evidence of a, a nascent nuclear threat. And of course, this is something that is now being discussed again today with regard to uh, the uh, nuclear program in Iran. And in the Chernobyl case, uh, given the initial secrecy uh, and misinformation uh, subsequent to the, the, to the accident, uh, and then the evidence of the uh, radioactive, downwind radioactive uh, uh, impact in uh, Central Europe and, and the Baltic states. There were serious concerns about international safety, nuclear safety. So I, I'm sure the members would be interested to hear your views on the role that the IAE played in both of these events and uh, also your personal views on those subjects. Well, on the Israeli attack on the Osirak reactor in 1981, there was something that already happened when I came to the IEA. Um, I, and as you say, it raises the question of a unilateral act without any authorization of the Security Council. They certainly did not have that, and they subsequently they attacked also in Syria and uh, without any authorization. And the matter has been discussed, it was discussed in a high-level committee uh, appointed by Kofi Annan with Scowcroft and uh, with Primakov and with Lord Hanai and, and others. And um, this specific issue about a, a nuclear threat, um, I also remember, and I come to what they said, but I remember that in the US there was discussions about an attack on China, uh, the Chinese nuclear program, when they realized that it would be coming along, it was decided against it. Now, in the, this commission in the UN uh, was very strongly against it. They said the UN Charter is uh, prohibits any threat of use of force against the territorial integrity and, and borders of other, other states unless you have an authorization of the council or you have a, it, it is a, a response, self-defense against an armed attack. And there was no attack from, from Osirak, from the Iraqi side at that time. I think many people also doubt that really Saddam, and there's been written about this, that doubt that Saddam was, had taken a decision to go for nuclear weapons at that time. But he came to that conclusion. Of course, the Israelis and others didn't do very much. Nor would I say the IEA did manage very much, because we were then operating under the old safeguard system, 
And under that system, we went to installations which were declared. Uh, and in fact, we, we wouldn't have known where to go elsewhere because we had no satellite images, we had no intelligence coming from anybody, so we only could go to what was declared. And the main function was seen to be checking the diversion of peaceful material. That was the fear that the private, the nuclear industries, uh, peaceful nuclear industries, that they would divert. And so that was the main task. But one had not thought very much about someone hiding it on them. And I'm not sure the. The Iraqis didn't hide that reactor, it was built by the, by, by the French. Um, so the, it may well be, it's a moot question at any rate, whether, it, whether Saddam was on his way. And I don't think anyone has a really good record <laughs> uh, on in, in that affair. And uh, now, you, as you say, the similar situation with relation to Iran. We have heard the US President, both Bush and, and Obama, say that all options are on the table. I don't think a president could say anything else. Do you rule out that we use bombing? I don't think he could say all options are on the table. In reality, I don't think at this stage, at any rate, that there is a, a bombing option, whether with conventional weapons or otherwise. When today the, if the, the uh, Iranians are participating in the, in the battle against the ISIS, and uh, they are uh, probably one of the more stable countries in the, in the area. Whether they actually were moving towards a weapon. Uh, well, I would say that there was good reason for suspicion because they were building a program of enrichment of uranium which was far too big for what they really needed. They had research reactor 20 megawatts and uh, they were only uh, getting the reactors that were built for by the Russians, by the Germans first and then by the Russians. And I think only one of them is operation now. So having enrichment capacity for uh, for that reactor, building it up was pretty much. But one must remember, and I think it's often forgotten in the Western world, what were the, the background. I mean, the, when, when Khomeini came to power, the, the Iranians needed a new fresh fuel for the Giga reactor. And they ordered it in the US because it was a Giga reactor, and they paid for it. They got neither money back nor did they get any, any fuel. And eventually they had to buy, they managed to buy it from Ar Argentina. Mm -hmm. And then the US tried to stop them everywhere. Uh, and, and so it may well be that they felt, yes, yes they could not rely upon any, for the outside world and the mar market uh, to get the fuel. However, that was not a, a reason for going to the size that they had. It was oversized and that rightly raised suspicions. Um, now, what was the explanation that did they aim at a weapon? I do not, I cannot rule it out that, that some of them in, in that government uh, were aiming at it. But it could also have been a spite, a pride that was led them in this way. And, and we now hear that Iran uh, should, uh, though they don't need enrichment, they, they should rely on the Russians. I think to me it sounds a little far-fetched because we also hear outside say same to Germany that you should not rely upon contracts about gas from Russia. But when it comes to Iran, they should be able to rely upon contracts about uranium. So this suspicion uh, came there. And, and, and I don't think that the main ob objection to it on the US and Western side to an attack, I think again, I'm sorry to say so, I don't think it's the UN Charter. I mean, as a lawyer, I think it would be illegal. Iran has not attacked, and it has no, there will be no authorization. I think that the main reason will be uh, that they don't know where it will end, that it, they, the situation in the far Middle East is difficult enough anyway, so they don't know where it's like pot. Uh, Colin Powell has said that if you break the pot, you right. own it. The pottery barn theory, uh, yes. Yeah. And I, I think that's the case. I hope very, very warmly that the negotiations that will be, should be ready by 24th of November, that they will work out. Uh, partly, at the present juncture, we'd also need a, some bright spot, some glipper, glimmer of hope in the world. Things are so bad in other respects, that we, we would need this. And, and I'm fond of saying that we, we can see some, what I call, mini resets. And I thought Syria is the first mini reset. I know reset is not a very popular word any longer here. But, but in the case of Syria, uh, that was going pretty close to an attack, a unilateral attack, which again, I think would have been a, a, a violation of the UN Charter, because there was no attack. They were not part of the CWC Convention. It would have been a violation of the UN Charter. And in addition, what, how could one explain that you would bomb a few installations as a punishment 
the US, US would be the world policeman for judging and punishing straight away. And then they would strike out a few things, weaken Assad somewhat, then he wanted that, to be sure, and no one thinks it was a very nice regime he had. But when the attack was over, we would say, say to the opposition in Syria, that now boys, you go back to your fighting, but, but clean, clean fighting, no, no chemical weapons, clean fighting. I thought that was a somewhat odd thing, and I'm very glad that it came out. It was not out of Russian magnanimity vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the US. The Russians had have two great powers, as we know. One is that they have nuclear weapons, and the other one is that they have a veto power in the Security Council. And they don't like very much have un US unilateral action. So here, they managed to steer what seemed to be a continuation of the Iraqi affair, a unilateral, US unilateralism, and steer it into the organized international community. Steer it back to the Security Council, where the decision-making power correctly constitutionally is, and to the OPCW in, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they gained on that. And I think it was a good thing for, for everybody, actually. They came. But, and, I, and I feel of it, look at it as a sort of mini reset. There was a situation in which, despite all the tensions and difficulties between the Russians and, and, the, other, and, and the West, that they were managed to, to set this aside and work on that field. And I think they're doing, trying to do the same thing on Iran today. And I think the more we have of that, the better, the better it is. Mm. Uh, interesting, uh, come, go back to your point about uh, the fact that the OSRAC reactor was not hidden. Of course, when the inspectors got in after the first Gulf War, they found the evidence of an actual attempt to hide uh, a nascent nuclear weapons, or at least an enrichment oh, yeah. capability in with the EMIS uh, uh, the plant that uh, yeah. the Iraqis had cleverly yeah. uh, hidden. Yeah. I don't think anyone knew that. Uh, not even the U.S. was sure that mm. they were doing it, but when we went in with the inspectors and the Americans see, had, US had seen on the satellite pictures swarms of people at the place where, where which they were bombing, then we, went, we got tips about that and we went in there and we were puzzled because they were using the, uh, an old type of Email. method. Yeah. Yeah. But it like was a magnetic isotope separation. Yeah, yeah. it right. was clearly a, right. an attempt to, to come to enrichment. They also tried with the centrifuges, which was a more modern, modern method. But that shows, again, uh, the weakness of intelligence. I mean, uh, they claimed that we were blind and, and we were received a lot of criticism for that, but they themselves uh, did not. The Israelis, of course, dis suspected the Iraqis in 1981, but I don't, we had no tips from them right. that it was accused at that time. And I remember another occasion in, in Argentina, when I was director general, uh, the Argentinians were building an enrichment plant in, in Pilcanyu. Uh, and I was invited to go to Argentina, and they, the day before I left, they phoned me and they t told me about this plant. The U.S. had not discovered it. Interesting. Um, I don't know if you want to comment at all about the Chernobyl. The Chernobyl. The aftermath <coughs> of that. Well, it had many. Perhaps the, the overriding thing is that, first, the, the, the people who died and the the area that was shielded off, which now is very prospering, and it's an area that's been kept off since 1986, so it's full of wildlife and wild horses and, right. and, and whatnot, and, and, and it's likely to be opened to the public again very soon. Uh, but it was a terrible disaster for the nuclear power, uh, and um, I don't think we can afford if we to go ahead with nuclear power. Many countries will be put off. The Germans were very severely put off by that time. They didn't stop nuclear until after Fukushima, but they, they were at the time, and the same effective in many other places. So while I am an advocate for trying to rationally explain to the public what are the benefits and what are the risks of nuclear power, and I think the benefits vastly overshadow uh, the, the risks, uh, nevertheless, when it comes to actually reaching people, reaching people's hearts and thoughts, this is not enough. Intellectual uh, persuasion is not enough. Uh, we can uh, try to speak about radiation uh, and explain the linear dose hypothesis and other things, but it, it will not really help. What we need is good operations, and operations have been improved very much over time. Uh, we have far fewer unplanned stoppages today than, the, than, than, than earlier. 
uh, for lower radiation doses to the professional people. So it has improved, but it's not enough. We simply cannot afford having accidents of this kind. And we do get new types of nuclear reactor. The te technical people are helping. Um, I, I asked the head of the NRC the other day on the platform whether uh, you could claim that the Westinghouse newest type, the AP1000, is a, has inherently said, cannot have a core melt. Now, they shouldn't want to go that far. But what they are, I think, can do with new type of reactors is guaranteeing that there will be no emissions oh, outside yeah. the plant. <coughs> and in the fourth generation, that is sucked still perhaps a decade or more off, then you can probably have an inherent guarantee that there will be no core melt at all. Right. I saw one, my wife and I were in China and saw a pebble bed reactor, and uh, where well, you have, have grains of uranium embedded in graphite, and they cannot have a, co a core melt at that yeah. point. So um, if, if we survive, <laughs> if nuclear industries survive the present crisis, uh, then I think we will see newer and uh, and stronger animals uh, on the scene. And the world scene is actually very mixed. Uh, we see Germany phasing out, we see Switzerland also phasing out, Italy also not going forward, Belgium where you have a Green Party in uh, one, uh, uh, strong position, and French also a Green Party played a role. But you go to China, they build as much nuclear power as they can. And uh, the uh, South Koreans do, the Japanese of course are in, in, in holding pattern. Vietnamese are building, the Turks are, are building, India is building as much as they can. So it, it's a very mixed picture uh, around the world. As to the, the reasons for the, uh, re the accident in Chernobyl, I have two. I'm a lawyer, so I shouldn't be really have to know much about it. But I had two, two reasons. One was that there were weaknesses in the construction of it, and that was well known before. Uh, and, um, and it was a reactor that was very good at producing plutonium. That was the main, one of the main purposes why they went for it. The other, I think, was had to do with the Soviet system, with the question of responsibility. In the Western world, nuclear staff are encouraged to be questioning and to have confidence but also be questioning. But in the Soviet system, questioning was not. Right. The, it was the authority, the directors and above the directors, the ministers and the government in the last resort that decide. If they have decided, well, it's their responsibility. And that is not a very good attitude. Right. Let's move on to another topic. Another major milestone during your tenure at the IAEA was the negotiation of the additional protocol, which uh, enhanced the ability of mm -hmm. your organization to do more aggressive on-site inspection, uh, if not uh, uh, surprise inspection, at least short notice inspections. Uh, to investigate other uh, ancillary activities beyond the, the uh, nuclear facility itself. Um, so th the question, I guess, is uh, given the behavior of certainly of the DPRK, uh, where they, of course, broke out of the treaty, but uh, uh, both the Iran case, the, the North Korean case, uh, raised the question and be interested in your view as to whether uh, had the additional protocol been in place, would these programs have been uh, detected, and from the standpoint of other states that may be seeking to emulate the uh, the North Korean uh, p pattern, where they developed it in secret and then announced they were withdrawing from the treaty, uh, would it find these development programs soon enough? Well, I, the first point I think is that the world is not milling of would-be proliferators. There's a sort of attitude in the West that everyone is keen to do as if they can get away with it. That is not so. I mean, even if the NPT were to collapse, uh, I think most of the countries that are, are, are part to this will say that we have decided to join this treaty because we think it's in our interest not to have nuclear weapons, we are not going to have it, and we want to signal that by joining the protocol. So I think there are very few cases in the world where they really would make a difference. But the protocol does help us to have a uh, confidence-creating mechanism in the safeguard system. And when the nuclear started, uh, then the, to enforce or demand uh, inspection by international inspectors in big industrial installations was not anything popular in the countries of those days. Germany, Belgium were traditionally very negative to having inspectors milling around, especially as the nuclear weapon states did not have to do it. Now, they consented to do it on a voluntary basis, uh, which was some, some little consolation. 
But anyway, the attitude traditionally in the world is not to accept international inspection. So it was something novel, uh, and, and I think very important. And I think fact-finding, impartial fact-finding, is a very valuable feature in the world. Just as we have our criminal investigations, we want to have uh, also professional and capable organizations that do it objectively. We are not there as an enemy, but we are there as a trustee uh, in, in the world. Now, there was this attitude that meant that the whole system of safeguards inspection by the IEA did not, were not given much teeth. Uh, they were to check, focus upon the nuclear fissionable material, and they were in practice confined to go into sites that were declared. And as I said, they wouldn't even have known where to go elsewhere, mm -hmm. because we had no intelligence, we had no spies, we had no satellites at that time, and we didn't get any intelligence from anybody else. So it was a, a weakness, weak system, and I think in most cases in our reports we said that we have not detected any diversion in the sites declared, but it may, I also found cases in which they went a little too far and said there weren't any, because that's two, two different things, to say that we haven't seen anything and they haven't, haven't uh, detected an anything. And so in 1991, when it was discovered that the Iraqis had actually hidden and had a clandestine uh, activity to generate uh, enriched real uranium, we drew the conclusion that the system needs to be changed. And I'm aware that in politics, uh, timing is, is half a thing, <laughs> perhaps not everything, but it's, it's quite important. This was an occasion when you could move forward. Just as after the Chernobyl accident, we moved forward with the Convention of Nuclear Safety. The international community was able then to do something that many, including the US, had resisted before that. Well, here was an occasion when the whole safeguard system could be strengthened. And we did that, and uh, it was the safeguards department that took the initiative, not I myself, I should give the credit to them, and some two Americans in the safeguards department, so moreover, who were the instrumental, they worked with Norm Wolf, the State, State Department, Laura Rockwood in the legal division, they worked with me, and we presented the Board of Governors the proposal for what new powers we think we should have. And uh, then brought it to the Board of Governors, and we discussed it there, and they came with their comments, and, and, and we revised it, and it took in 1997, it was ready. It was the year that I, I left, resigned uh, from my, my position, and, and I was very happy about it. It gives much, much more power. But above all, or one of the things was the so-called environmental monitoring. You, the nuclear gives such signs uh, of footprints mm -hmm. that they're very easy to detect if you have the, have the, the right instruments. I mean, people are scared of nuclear because we don't see it, we don't hear it, etc. But with the instruments, you can even, even the tiniest things you can detect. So if you go in Iraq, we, we learned it in Iraq, it was on the US side that it was developed, and we used to call it, we take the urine test <laughs> of the Iraqis just to take urine test of the drug addicts. We could go and take a, a liter of water in the, in the river and then test it and you will see. You could take some samples of leaves or sand or whatever and you could find it. So that was a new technique that was developed during the Iraqi affair and which then went into this. But also much more obligations for states to declare and we were able to put many more tests and so forth. So that was a great pull for But I would like to warn against, nevertheless, against any view that you have a 100% certainty. I mean, you can still hide somewhere something and so you need many sources. And I, when I ask about intelligence in, in the context of our, our work in Iraq, I say, well, there are different things. The, the intelligence people, they listen to our telephone conversations, including mine uh, and El uh, but, but others that may be more rewarding for them to do so, they have spies on the ground, they look at what kind of instruments or equipment are sold to countries, what type of buy directly or indirectly, so they have a lot of sources of information that inspectors don't have, but inspectors can go anywhere. They can talk to people. So they have a very direct input. And so I don't despise the intelligence, though I, I know this sometimes went very, very bad, very wrong. Uh, but I think that those who receive the information, the government receive the information from the intelligence and from the inspectors, they should see if they tally. And if they do tally, well, that's interesting. If they don't, well, then so we should be a little cautious. And in the case of Iraq, 
they don't really care. Maybe they don't spend, didn't spend enough billion to, to look important, I don't know. <laughs> but, and certainly they, they wanted to go ahead with an attack that perhaps not necessarily was uh, prompted by the fear of weapons of mass, mass destruction. The protocol to us is, is a great step forward and, uh, and helpful, but I, one should not overstate it. We say that we have two goals. We want to know, know that the declarations are correct and that they are also uh, comprehensive. But uh, on the comprehensiveness, we cannot be. But it would also be wrong to say that everything uh, is that the safeguards is the, uh, it's not the only means. I said, you have science, you read newspapers, you see the foreign policy of a country. Uh, we do not think that like a country like Vietnam would very likely move towards nuclear weapons. But you may have other cases. There was some reports about Burma for a while, there were reports about Zimbabwe for a while, etc. So there are many signs that we're reading. But this is a very, very powerful, nowadays a very powerful thing. I think I will ask one more and then we'll open it up to the, to the members. Um, you just made reference to uh, attempts that states might make to, to cover up things and that it's difficult to do. But uh, if the P5 plus one negotiation with Iran is successful, and we're about a month away now from the deadline, which could, I suppose, be extended, but assuming for the moment that they do reach agreement, uh, I wonder if you could draw on your experience both at IAEA and Senate Umovic to speculate about uh, what will be required. I presume that IAEA would be the logical locate, you know, uh, organizational entity to, to conduct more enhanced and rigorous inspections. But we kn already know, for example, that at Parchin, uh, the Iranians have paved over certain areas, thereby making it almost impossible to do environmental sampling. Uh, so the question is, how will the, the, the P5 plus one and other states get a sufficient level of confidence that uh, this program has really been suspended? Well, Iran is a lot more open country than North Korea, to be sure. Yes. It doesn't, say, it doesn't say very much. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but it certainly is. Uh, and there will be many, many pieces of information coming out from opposition in Iran and from the satellites. Uh, so I think there will be a fair amount. I would be, well, I would certainly be surprised if they played the cheats again. In a way, I'm somewhat more worried about the intelligence because there is as much disinformation as there is information. There was a book published by Gareth Porter in the US some time ago about the whole Iranian affair. And uh, well, he certainly maintains that much of the evidence that was given to the IA was really cooked, mm. uh, was not authentic. Uh, and um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, I, I saw in the case of Iraq when, when we worked here that on the, uh, on the question of the one type of, of biological anthrax, was anthrax, that I had an inspector who told me that the information we had and the information we've got from the intelligence on the US side clearly shows that there must be, I don't know what, 3,000 tons or 300 tons, whatever. It would have fit, fitted figures fit it very nicely. And I said, well, what is the intelligence we get from it? Do we get to see the real evidence or not? No, we cannot say. Well, then I said, I'm not going to rely on this. I'm going to say that there are strong indications, but I'm not going further than that. Now, it turned out later on when, when we went in and, and the Saddam was gone, that and we asked them, well, what happened? What, what, was there something hidden? They said, no, that this quantity had been taken for destruction but they had such a short time, they dumped it a bit too near Saddam's palaces. <laughs> and they would never admit and let it be known. <laughs> Not good for their health to admit that. <laughs> Wouldn't have been good for their health, no. Uh, so the intelligence, uh, I think one has to be very cautious. In the case of Iran, I think one should be super cautious with, with the kind of disinformation you can get as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, um, I think at this time I would like to invite members to uh, pose uh, to join the conversation and pose questions. Uh, I'd like you to bear in mind that uh, this series is called History Makers, so uh, it's important to keep the questions focused on uh, Dr. Blix's past experience, uh, although I guess I've already violated that to some degree, but uh, uh, that's to be the main focus. Uh, please wait for the microphone to be handed to you and stand and identify yourself, and uh, we will uh, try to get as many questions as we can. So try to be brief. Yes, sir. 
Here's a microphone coming right at there. Uh, Steven Schlesinger from the Century Foundation. Um, the uh, issue of Iran, uh, I, I know you don't want me to ask futuristic questions, but I can't help it. Uh, <laughs> do you think it would be a terrible thing if Iran ever got the, uh, t the uh, uh, nuclear weapon? Or do you think w it would lead to other countries in the Middle East the demanding their share in, 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 in nuclear production? Or, or, or can be Iran, if they got the nuclear weapon, could, could they be contained? Uh, in other words, as a kind of different way of looking at the arrangement and situation in the Middle East. Right. Well, there has been and there remain, would remain the fear that if Iran were to go for nuclear weapons, you would also have other countries in the Middle East doing the same thing. Saudi Arabia and, and Egypt they would have a, a spread of it. Just as I think in the case of North Korea, I would have been even more worried that uh, a more provocative nuclear behavior by North Korea could one day trigger Japan, where you have hawkish people who say that they should also go for it. And that would be a, a totally different situation in Paris. But returning to Middle East, I, I think what would happen if they really went for that, and no one discusses the option that they could perhaps withdraw from the NPT. Just like yeah. DPRK did. And they might say that there are now two or three US aircraft carriers in the Gulf, and we have that all options are on the table. And we don't think we get any benefit from this either, so we thereby denounce it and, and withdraw it. Now then, there would be nothing illegal about going for a weapon. Israel is not doing Ill anything illegally. They have never been part of the NPT. And so it's not illegal what, what they've done, but it does have some effects anyway. Now, if the Iranians were, I don't think they will. I mean, I'd be, I was there not so long ago uh, and, and discussed with many of them. I don't think they would go for a, a nuclear weapon. But you have one group sitting in power now, maybe you have other people on, on some other thing, that they have the capacity that they can do it, yes. If, we, if they talk about breakout capacity here, but that's a, how long time would it take for them to put together so much nuclear material that they have the intellectual capacity, they know how to do it. Uh, and uh, we've always known that that is, uh, is in, in the hands of anyone who has enough money and enough technical level they can develop it. So they, they would have it in their hands, I don't think they will. If they did, well, my guess is, but I'm not an expert at the, that it would neutralize the Israeli nuclear weapon because there could be a second strike. The Israeli threat of using a nuclear weapon in the last resort would not be there any longer. And I've been somewhat positive to the idea, somewhat I've been very positive to the idea of a, a nuclear weapon free zone for the Middle East, which was uh, supported by the last latest NPT conference and, and it was one of the reasons why the, uh, the prolongation of the NPT came about, that the Arabs were promised conference that would discuss a nuclear weapon free zone. Now, I'm, my thought is simply this, that if, if Israel feels that there should be no enrichment whatever in Iran, that's the position they've taken, there should be none, whatever, then I think it would be in their hands to get it, they, they wouldn't go by my way, I don't think they were, but it would be in their hands, they could say that we are ready to join that zone, and that would mean we would do away with our nuclear weapons, and we would do away with our factories in which we produce plutonium, with strict, in, strict inspection, but it would presuppose that the Iranians also dismantle theirs, and that Egypt and Saudi Arabia and others commit themselves to inspection, strong inspection, and not go for it. You can find other sources of en enrichment in the world. You could have it outside. Um, so it's not impossible. I don't think the Israelis would certainly wouldn't agree, <laughs> agree with it now, uh, and perhaps ne never do so. But, but I think it, it would be in their hands. I mean, saying simply that Iran cannot have it and we can have it, well, I think that's a, at least a position that is not uh, sort of endorsed by, <laughs> by everybody. I, I don't think the Israelis, that the Iranians are going for it, but uh, and I think that it would be a, a, a good thing uh, if, they, if they get an agreement now. I'll take a question on this side, yes. Um. Hello, good to see you again, Dr. Blix. Um, Evelyn Leopold, journalist at the UN, who covered him minutely years ago. <laughs> anyway. Um, 
there seems to be a, a big cry among many nations to get a nuclear reactor. And I wonder if they can handle it, if safely get rid of the waste, or is it just boys wanting their toys? Uh, I think the newest uh, types of missiles are greater toys, and I worry more about them because they are the toys of military people who know how to shoot. The nuclear reactors, when you look at the U.S. attitude to the reactors in North Korea, they too had something to do with in the agreed framework. I mean, the U.S. was so little concerned about building light water reactors in North Korea that they agreed to help to fin finance this. And the same thing in Iran, although they did tell the Russians that they should not continue supporting it, yeah. but it was more rather because they feared that there could be a nuclear scientist coming in the, in the train of people going from Russia to Iran. And now we have seen how the Europeans, the Brits and the French and the Germans, they said to the Iranian that if you go along with a suspension of, uh, or strong re reduction of the enrichment capacity, we are willing to help you to build up the nuclear power industry. And the U.S. has come along on that. So I think it shows that these countries that cannot really be suspected of being uh, indifferent, the question of non-proliferation, that they, yes, light water reactors, not worry very much. Theoretically, you can reprocess the fuel, spent fuel that comes out, but in practice it is it's not really, a, it's not a practical way. You don't get very good plutonium that way. And secondly, it will also be picked up and, and discovered immediately. So I do not see, I, enrichment is a different matter. If you go for reprocessing, it's a different matter. You talk about the Iraq reactor in Iran, well, that's a reactor that's very good for producing plutonium. It's one reason why one, well, they are suspicious about it. Why do you build a research reactor that is so very good to producing plutonium? But they don't have any re reprocessing capacity. And if without a reprocessing capacity, it's not that, that ominous, I would say. So um, I can see and understand many arguments against nuclear power, but I think that it remains mainly the, the big one is the question of sa safety, if there is any escape or radioactivity, because that is long-lived, long-living. Uh, you, you don't have very many casualties, actually, even after Chernobyl. You can calculate, but there are between 40 and 50 who died immediately. There were a number of children who got thyroid cancers, yes, but they have not seen any increased mortality among the so-called liquidators, those who were sent in, you don't see any increased mortality in this. But it's, it's still, it's, I, I think there's an abhorrence against the idea of injury or de even more death cancer from, from nuclear that scares people. And, and that we can only cure, I think, in the long run by having such safe operations that, that it won't happen. The light water, I don't think that the proliferation argument is terribly strong, really. The waste argument is there, but again, what do we do with the fossil waste? It, we, this the atmosphere that is dump site, routine dump site for the wa waste of the nuclear. The waste from the nuclear power is put down 500 meters more in the ground, in the crust of the earth from where the uranium one once came. And uh, I mean, nothing is totally the zero risk, but I think it's certainly really rather good. Yes, sir. My name is Charles Gano. I was in North Korea last month, and repeatedly I got comments, uh, why do you imperialist Americans want to invade us? And then when the conversation was passed to nuclear weapons, the insistence was that that's strictly for defensive purposes. And they would cite all kinds of reasons as to why they thought we were going to invade us, including the war games we held in August, where an American general talked about a preemptive invasion of North Korea and a quick capture of Pyongyang as part of the, the war games they were holding, but they cited other things. My question is, if the United St States took a different policy and instead of intimidating North Korea, uh, said in effect, we will tr we're seeking an agreement with you, we will, we will remove our uh, nuclear weapons from South Korea, and we will take other measures to assure you we're not going to invade you, do you think the North Koreans would come around to some sort of controls on their nuclear program? Are there any U.S. nuclear weapons to South Korea now? Weren't, weren't they withdrawn uh, under Bush the elder? But they think, they think they're, 
they cite the fact they, they think they that think so yes yeah. Right. yeah no I, I think you make a, a good point uh, I mean we go back to the Korean War 1950 from what I have read US commanders asked the authority to use nuclear weapons and they they had the authority but they did not use use them I don't think the Koreans have ever come over that that suspicion or belief that they would be attacked with nuclear weapons. And they also, of course, they is such a closed society that they can feed these, these feelings. And you get people on the US side who occasionally say that, yeah, we, we might have to do it. And that doesn't make them any calmer. So I think that if one is to have a settlement with them, I think you will have to um, comprise also a security order for the region in which you have not only the US, uh, but also Japan and Russia and China. But the fear I have is that it might not be enough. A worry I could have is that you have military in control of the country and that the military may need to have a constant <laughs> trouble percolation in the area to justify their own power. Now then they can say one day is sunshine, the next time it is, it but I, but I agree with you. I think that one, you get further with carrots than with sticks. I remember as John Bolton said, I don't do carrots. <laughs> I, I always wondered how he brought up his own children. <laughs> but I, I think you probably get further with carrots and with consistency. And that's difficult in a free world as we are with lots of generals and admirals who have, have different views. I think they have tried also. I think the U.S. has certainly held out to North Korea that, look here, you can have a peace treaty, right. no. and you can have guarantees, etc. But I think you would need to come together, not only the U.S., they look at the U.S. as the big enemy, of course, but I think you would need an arranged security order for the region. The alternatives are pretty awful because they are moving ahead now, and as I mentioned a moment that if they were, to trigger some Japanese hawks. And we have a fairly hawkish Japanese prime minister at the moment, and they're modifying the constitution. Well, that could change very much. So now this leads me to the conclusion again that I think China, China has an enormously strong reason to avoid that North Korea moves on with the nuclear weapon capacity, because they would face the risk that Japan went to this direction. You have South Korea, you have South Koreans, the big discussion between the US and South Korea is about enrichment. The South Koreans say we should, I mean, we have such a big nuclear establishment that we should have our own enrichment, and the US has been pretty reluctant uh, to that. So, sir, I agree, I agree with you. I, I think you're right, one should try the carrots if they work. I can just add the complicating factor here, I think, is though that the, as the North Koreans have been preparing apparently to test longer range missiles. Uh, this adds a great, uh, the kind of, of reaction oh. you're getting from the U.S. military is reflecting the fact that suddenly there could be an existential threat if the North Koreans have a longer range missile that can range Guam, can range Hawaii or possibly uh, and Alaska, mm -hmm. uh, combined with uh, an existing nuclear capability, nuclear weapons capability. Well, I think the military always, they, it's, it's right. I mean, we are diplomats and we think in diplomatic terms. I'm a lawyer, think in lawyer terms. The military think in military terms. So they say, if we, they have this, then we must have that. If they move there, we must move there. And it is a very sort of simplistic exercise, I think. And in my view, the civilian governments that we have in the Western world, that they must have an overview of it all, in which you consider the military, but not, not be sort of commanded by it. I'll try to get someone in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, Jeff Laurenti. Uh, Hans, could you share with us, please, um, from your experience, the difficulties that you may have found in assuring the integrity and impartiality of international weapons inspectors, particularly in situations where you have to take people on from member states for short <laughs> periods of time, so their loyalty is not going to be guaranteed to some international vision because they're not going to be on the payroll forever. Uh, but rather have to look to their own futures back home. Uh, did you see that in UNSCOM, for example? Uh, and uh, could you also share with us your sense of how what had been the consensus within the Security Council among the Permanent Five on uh, Iraqi disarmament broke down in 95, 96, 
97 with the Clinton administration breaking away to bomb Iraq because it was convinced that the inspections weren't working, which some would say led almost inevitably to 2003. Um, where do you see those things happening? I think the civil service is a great asset in countries, and I think it's an equally important asset in international organizations. The British invented it, and I think that the politicians, they, have, they get elected, they have their platforms, they have a wish to do certain things, and they, they feel they, they have, or approved by the electorate. Uh, so it's fair, they decide, but they need a dossier that is factual. That's the least we could ask. When they start fiddling with the dossiers, whether it's science or the environment or anything else, then I'm, I'm worried. They should leave that to the civil servant. And the civil servants should be, not be corrupted. <laughs> they should be factual. And, and I think the, this, what the question you ask is absolutely pertinent. And the IEA had a tradition of a very good civil service, with people coming as inspectors from all, all over the world. And in UNSCOM that came in to take part of inspections on, on biological, chemical, and missiles, whereas we had the, the nuclear. UNSCOM wa was created, and they, had to, they didn't have the money. They had to go to government and say, can you give us some inspectors, some good people? And they got a lot of good, excellent people from the CIA and from <laughs> the British service, and, and C PhDs, and very capable people, actually. But of course, in, in a number of cases, I'm sure, they retained their links. And uh, in the, whereas the IA, the, the UNESCO were rather contemptuous of the IA and said, these guys go in with their striped pants as diplomats, etc. whereas we are, they really go, and we, we do something. And that was very popular with media. But uh, it also, the, the, the close links with intelligence, I think, meant that certainly the Iraqis had no confidence in them at all. And they were also, to a large extent, I think, uh, inspired by a smile word, or they were led by intelligence of what to do. And it's been testified by Gallucci and others. I mean, it's, it's on the record. And, and eventually, when Butler was here, it was a, a, a scandal. And <coughs> World News Papers, New York Times, and others wrote about how they actually, it was intelligence that led it. The UNSCOM always had an American as a vice president, a vice chairman. And there was one thing that Colin Powell and, and Dr. Lisa Rice asked me about many times was, couldn't I have somebody in my office from the US side? And I, I was sort of pushed to the side <laughs> gently and diplomatically. But I realized that the moment I had an American close to me in the office, they would say, ah, oh, well, now the US is taking over on Scom. And these, I wouldn't say that the Israelis really, uh, the Iraqis really trusted us. They were with those difficulties also in relations. But I think they, they probably saw that we, we made an effort to be be objective. We are asked by journalists, uh, uh, how is the quality? We had, we had the feeling that we had many more PhDs among the people in UNSCOM than you have. And I said, well, I, I don't claim that we are the world's brightest, but I can assure you that we are in nobody's pocket. <laughs> and I certainly was not in nobody's pocket uh, at all. I could, an amusing thing, I, during that period, I traveled by the, um, by the subway in London to, to a meeting about Chernobyl, by the way. And a guy sat next to me. And he looked at me, and I, s I saw that he wanted to strike up a, co a, a conversation. I was very, not very keen to have a conversation, so I looked forward. And eventually, he couldn't contain himself, said, looked over to me and said, are you Richard Butler? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but during Butler's period, of course, you had a strong feeling that this had gone overboard. And the General Assembly, the General Security Council, when they adopted Resolution 1284, for Unmovic, which I chair later, says specifically that the inspectors per staff should be under, under Article 100 of the Charter, civil servants that take no instructions from anywhere, and also enjoins member states not to try to infiltrate and to make it. And I think the US and others have sinned a lot. We, we look upon the US as a friendly country, a benevolent country, but, I, but you who have been in government, you also know that the hands are pretty strong. Uh, and I, when I read what El Bardet was subjected to, I, I never had unpleasant relations. I must say, but with Condoleezza Rice and others were fine. But El Bardet, I think, was subjected to a much, much harder method and me threats than I was. So I think it's in the long-term interest of the US and others to have an objective 
it's international civil service, civil servants that, that really deserve the name. And we try to behave that way. And in the case of Iraq, I think in the 90s, the Iraqis distinguished between us and the, uh, and the UNSCOM. I don't know whether that's compliment to us. There, there were occasions when they say, we will not have any American and British inspectors from UNSCOM. But they did not say the same to us. We could still send Americans and Brits as our inspectors, but UNSCOM could not do it under that injunction. So it's, it's a value for everybody, and I should not be squandered. I feel that intelligence people everywhere probably since about it. And I know that in the IAEA, the Russians had many people who were copying lots of documents. There were no great secrets, but they copied what were sent back during the, during the Cold War. And I don't think it's in the long-term interest, but, but how do you keep intelligence people under control? I, don't know, I mean, they operate, most, much of the time, they operate illegally anyway. And so they're used to that. And at home, they're often covered by secrecy. I think it's a great problem, and I think it requires a lot of oversight and, and a strong hand on the part of the civilian government that, yes, we, we need international civil servants and we need national civil servants. Of course, there was a period in the 90s when it was fairly clear that Saddam was playing a shell game and moving things. You know, no. uh, inspectors arrive at the front gate and no. the trucks are going out the but back gate. But why did he do that? <coughs> why did he do that? I mean, after all, we know now that most of it was destroyed in 1991 and 1992. So why did the guy, I mean, I also thought in the autumn of 2002, I thought there was, there were some, not nuclear, because that, that I've seen, no, no, no nuclear, but biological and chemical and missile, I thought there were. And I was impressed by the fact that he had thrown them out and stopped them from getting into one building or another. One, I brooded much about on this. And some, uh, one explanation is that he wanted to impress upon his own people and especially upon the Iranians that, ah, oh, well, I might still have it. I'm still dangerous. I might still have it. I have another thought, and that is that he was just so angered by what he saw as the arrogance of the inspectors. They could kick in the doors and be rather brutal. There was a question of humiliation. And, and I always took great care that we should be like the, what we admire the old British Bobby to be, a sort of trusted <laughs> agent of society. And, and I think we succeeded relatively well within that. But I should never underestimate the fury that comes from humiliation. And I think Saddam felt he was a damn proud fellow. I mean, he, after all, he, he wanted to be the emperor of Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, he was, so this is a very valid question. Uh, another question in the back, yes, over there. Hi, Mike Moran from uh, Control Risk. Uh, having been kind of downrange, so to speak, in the UN for, for much of the time, uh, what would you do with the cottage industry that, that is the UN Security Council reform debate? If you could do anything, one thing, to change the orders that flow and create the environment you had to work in, what would it be? Well, I think we were well placed in the UN. I mean, I was not uh, subordinate to Kofi Annan, uh, and, uh, but I, I worked nicely with him. I said, I, I think that you are a very good judgment, and I want to discuss these things with you, and we were never had any disagreement. I know that both the Chaos and, uh, and Butler had their difficulties occasionally. We did not. I had very good support there uh, all the way through. Now, Unmovic, of course, was subject to less red tape than many other outfits are in the UN. It's a big bureaucracy. Uh, we had our own budget, and we could handle it uh, as, as with a lot of freedom. Uh, and that facilitated things. I still think that the UN, of course, is, I don't know whether you've heard of it in Washington. I mean, here in New York, you have heard of the organization. Uh, and, uh, and in the U.S. public, I think it is seen with more uh, positive feelings than, than in, among the politicians, among the political elite. Uh, to me, well, I get, get back to this Syrian case and the Ira Iran case now, where you have the five permanent members. I mean, I, I see of the Security Council, which have the power to take decisions, and the decisions are bounding, binding upon member states. This is something enormous. In 1945, 
was something enormous that I irreverently I would call them the five warlords. The five warlords who won the Second World War, thank God. They said that, yeah, we won the Second World War, and now we will keep some order in the world together. And we have the power to do so. And unfortunately, you got the Cold War that paralyzed the organization to 1990. And then the end of the Cold War came, and Bush the Elder, I think, was very skillfully handling the first Iraq affair, and he said afterwards that this is a new international order, remember. And I think so, and it was very, it was wonderful, wonderful days, uh, because the Security Council functions, the five warlords were together again, and they were. They, on the case of Syria, they went outside, the Russians and the Americans went outside, and they got an agreement, and then they spread it to the P5, and it worked out, and having agreed in Geneva, well, then they moved with the Security Council in New York. And what they don't have in, in Geneva, namely a, a legal stamp on it, when they get to the Security Council and they have the rest of the Council with them, to be sure, that's, they get a legal imprint upon it. It's valid. It's constitutional. No one questions it. It's valid. And, and there I see a great, a great importance in the international so society that we have an institution which can take formidable decisions. And they did so in the case of Syria, and they are about to do so, I hope, in the case of, of Iran. So the, the Council, we are not back to the Cold War level. The Council still takes decisions about lots of peacekeeping operations. It is not paralyzed. You know, people say that a great problem is with the composition of it. Well, it's clear that today's world does not, it's not the same as in 1945. And, and countries like Japan and Germany, India and Brazil uh, and others get in. I think they want to get in for the wrong reasons. They want to get in because that's part of the glory. <coughs> I am favoring having big countries there <coughs> because it strengthens the economic power of the Council. They have quite a lot of military power to be sure, but it strengthens their economic power, it strengthens their authority generally. Though having another three or four countries with a veto power is also an odd thing, and the person I would favor the construction which would allow some countries to come in more often than other, than, than other countries do. And if one could also engineer a voluntary restraint on the part of the P5 to exercise veto, not to exercise it outside the Chapter 5 situation. But this has been tried for years, and if I look back upon the Iraq affair, I do not think that it really would have made much of a difference if we had had uh, Japan and India and Germany and Brazil and others in. I don't think the result would have been different. But by and large, the Council would have been a heavier institution with having the big states in uh, on perhaps on a periodic basis. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. <coughs> Coming around. Nancy Kinsner. On the beach in Cuba, there is a nuclear reactor which is in a state of disrepair. <coughs> I don't know, in fact, whether it's ever been functional. The Cuban press says that there's been an agreement with Russia to reactivate or make functional that facility. Should we have any worry about that? No, it's, uh, first of all, I, I wonder seriously question whether they will go ahead with well, many years ago that I was there, and I saw these rusting structures down there, so I, I think it would take a lot of skill to breathe any new life into it. And secondly, they are light water reactors. They are 440 me megawatt reactors, if I remember rightly, old-fashioned, uh, and uh, they are not, they're not proliferating. So, so that as long as they don't go for enrichment <coughs> uh, or reprocessing, I don't wor worry from the non-proliferation point of view. But if I may say one last word about intervention. <coughs> you know, the peace researchers claim that we have fewer wars in the world now than we used to have. And I think they are true statistically. Uh, uh, this is the right. But intervention is another matter. Um, President Obama said, recently talked about the U U Russian action in the Ukraine and said that, well, he himself had been against the Iraq war, but the U.S. did not took care uh, to stay within uh, some bounds. They did not go there to annex, I think, was the, the key, key word in it. But of course, 
the Charter pro prohibits not only annexation of countries, but also threat of use of force uh, without authorization from the Security Council. And I'm wondering, going on from this observation that there are fewer wars in the world, whether we are not, maybe naive, a little too optimistic, moving to a situation with fewer interventions, fewer armed interventions. And I go back as an international lawyer and see what Teddy Roosevelt said <coughs> in the beginning of the 19th century before the invasion and before the intervention in Panama. He is reported to have, have uh, summoned his solicitor general of the US at the time and described the plan for intervention in Panama and asked the advice of the solicitor general. And the solicitor general was silent for a moment and then he said, Mr. President, why well, have such a beautiful plan marred by any petty legal considerations? <laughs> And I, well, that was the time. That was the beginning of the 19, what, 97 or something. And we have said many, many armed interventions since then. But I'm wondering whether the Iraq war perhaps was a bit of a watershed here. I mean, it did not really turn out well at all. I mean, they didn't find an Al-Qaeda because they weren't there. They were attracted by the US military, so they came there. They couldn't find any weapons of mass destruction because there weren't any there. And they couldn't they could create democracy, they created anarchy. I mean, it was really miserable, the whole thing. And then I think that was a shock coming upon Afghanistan, which also is a very tragic and horrible experience. I mean, intervention that was, it could have been avoided, could have been a, a punitary strike, punitive strike, but not more. And then we saw how the US was cautious in relation to Libya. They didn't want to go in, uh, give it halfway house, as it were. In the case of Syria, I had at least the impression that Obama was not at all keen on going in with a punitary state. And, and that the main reason for the push for him was that he, one should take seriously his word that he was ready to punish Iran. That was the main But he was not keen to go in there. And I don't think he's keen to go in in Iran. I think he's absolutely right. These are actions that, as I as a lawyer, find, no, you cannot justify them in terms of the UN Charter. And I don't think they worry so much about that in, in Washington, <laughs> frankly. They are worried about the consequences that they've seen of it, that they do not succeed. And they, once they remove the uh, Iraq, Iranian government, they removed Mossadegh, and what did they get instead? They removed Saddam Hussein, what did they get instead? They removed in Chile, a democratic government, yes. what did they get instead? Yes. So intervention, I think, has proved singularly well, perhaps not in every case. There are cases of successes too, maybe, but, but not so few. And I have the feeling that there is a greater, a greater restraint on that. And I'm not sure the Russian action in the Ukraine, to be sure, is an intervention, cannot be defended uh, under the UN Charter. But whether it is the old-fashioned grab, grabbing of land, that's another matter. I mean, I, I'm thinking more that it's an intervention. It is more like an intervention political purpose, and the limited purpose, I think, above all, to, to keep NATO out. We used to have, the West used to have a policy of containment to hold back the expanding, expanding Soviet communist empire, and it was successful and it was good. I have a feeling that the Russians, after Georgia and after Ukraine, say, no, this is our policy of containment. We are containing NATO, and we did so, we showed you in, in Georgia, with disproportion action, okay, and we are now showing the same thing. We don't want to have NATO integrated military apparatus on the Russian border, and therefore we destabilize, and, and, and I'm sure that they will not have, Ukraine is not going to become a member. I mean, I understand they would want so, <laughs> so, but they're not going, and Georgia is also not going, and for my part, I'm also would be very opposed to Sweden becoming a member of NATO, and, and that, that, I have many opponents in, in my own country. But, uh, but going back to it, I think that intervention is, is not a la mode any longer, and I think that's a good thing. Thank, thank you to the members for joining us this evening, this rainy evening. Thank you very much, and again, Dr. Blix, thank you.